Soccer Mums. So, Juliet, now you are a parent. That's right. And、uh, have you heard of all these terms that we have in the US for different types of parents? I wonder if you have them in the UK. You mean like soccer mum stuff like that? Exactly. <laughs> That's the only one I've heard of, actually. Okay, so what, what do you think a soccer mum is? What have you heard? My, my image is a mother who dedicates her time to running her kids to and from soccer practice. Is that <laughs> right? And also、right. drives a big vehicle. My image is like a big SUV or a big four wheel drive. Right. I think it's also it's like a parent that has many scheduled events for their child. Okay. So, like,、and、maybe they have swim、them. class, soccer practice, ballet, stuff like that. Oh, maybe I'm a little bit of a soccer mom. Yeah, I think, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think it's actually it's a good term. Like, it's, I think a soccer mom usually is consi- considered a, a caring parent. Okay. And they try to have their child do like pretty good. Pretty,、things. quite an affluent, perhaps middle class kind of. Yeah, yeah exactly, exactly. Now we have the equivalent, and it's called a NASCAR dad. <laughs> Is NASCAR some kind of car racing? Yeah, basically, it's just the, these cars, they run around and ride、right、around in a circle. It's kind of like horse racing for cars, they just、uh-huh. go round and round.、Um, but yeah, so I guess it's the same thing. It's just a dad who's really, you know, really into his kids. Spends a lot of time with his kids. Would this be、But、a stay at home dad? Like a... No, no. It's just kind of like a good old boy father, like a dad who's kind of blue collar,、um, not rich, you know, maybe, maybe lower, lower middle class, maybe, but just kind of like your typical sitcom, TV sitcom dad, I guess. But that's nice. Takes his kids everywhere. That's nice. Yeah, involved yeah. Involved in the. Yeah, like a NASCAR dad would probably take his son's hunting and maybe take his daughter shopping and stuff like that. Born to run. Well, actually, speaking of extreme sports, we're talking about extreme sports. Have you heard about ultra marathon? I'm reading a book right now that's about a, a tribe of ultra runners in Mexico, and I think it's going to. Come on to the subject of ultra marathon. Yeah, I mean, what, what does the book talk about? The book talks about this very old tribe who can run for days.、Like、days? Days. Yeah, and some of the members of this tribe are already in their 80s and 90s, and they scale mountains and they have a very frugal diet. They run barefoot. Barefoot? They run barefoot. In the desert, in on the rocks. Desert. Yeah, yeah. Wow.、Yeah. They are bought like they run from, well, from, they don't, as soon as they learn to walk, they, they're running and they run their whole lives. And they run like a hundred miles is, is just like a walk in the park to them. They just. That's at, at insane. Speed, at speed, at very high speeds. Well, I、and、mean, they, do they have some, some secret, some traditional secret? Well, yeah, yeah. They, they do. They're a very mystical tribe and they're, they're, they're not that well known. The, this, the book's written by a journalist who investigates and he records his story of how he gets to meet. Just even finding them and meeting them is a huge ordeal in itself. Because, I mean, physiologically, it sounds like that's impossible. Like the human body can only run so far because it needs water, it needs food, it needs well, rest. I don't know. I think the part of the philosophy of the book is that we're limited by our belief in that and that, in fact, this tribe don't have that belief, therefore, they don't have those limits. They kind of surpass those limits simply by they just do it. Nobody told them they couldn't, so they, they just did nobody it. Nobody told them they needed a pair of you know, $100 shoes in order to run. They, they just, they just, it's, it's like it's a natural human thing and it's like an atavistic thing. Wow. You know, humans, we can run down gazelle, we can run faster than horses. I mean, we can run further than horses and these cre- creatures that we think have an. Are you sure about that? Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Really? Yeah. I th- yeah. I've never heard that before. That's that- why, you know, people who, it's quite dangerous to run with, your, with a dog, for example. People who run and take the dogs because dogs can't run as far as humans. Really? Yeah. And dogs can't sweat. Humans can run and run and run for days. That's how they, that's how they killed prey when we were in the cave. <laughs> they just we, never gave up. They, no, they, you, can, you can outrun an antelope because. 
Antelope it, can only have short, sharp bursts of speed, ah. but a pack of humans can run down any animal on the planet. Well, that's good to know. Yeah. If I ever need to uh, <laughs> kill an antelope. Well, yeah, obviously, you can't just, you know, <laughs> stick your shoes on and set off. And <laughs> wow. Good stuff, though. So, but would you like to try it someday? Try one of these ultra marathons? I think it's good to have a goal, but I, um, I, I like training for these kind of things. An ultra marathon, I don't, I just mentally, I don't know I have that, that ability to run for that far and that long. I'd like to have. Yeah, I'd yeah. Like, yeah, I'd like to try and develop that stamina. Yeah. yeah. I think maybe, maybe in my younger days, but. Uh, no, no, I don't. Or think another you should, life, but I I'm going to pass. I think that, that running actually that requires a lot of maturity. So the older you get, the better you are at running because you give up on stuff when you're young and your brain's quite, you know, you can't concentrate. You learn concentration and discipline and they come with age and maturity. So I think we get better runners as we get older. That's what I'm banking on anyway. Yeah, me too. So <laughs> I got that on my side. <laughs> Alternative exercise. Hey, Julia. Hey, Todd. How are you doing? Good, good. Now, Julia, um, you are really fit, and also you are a yoga instructor uh-huh. and a runner. Uh-huh. So you are the perfect person to talk about um, extreme exercise. Extreme. I wouldn't say I'm an extremist, but go on. <laughs> okay. So um, first of all, I thought I would ask about this yoga that you do in like really hot rooms or something oh, like that. Oh, yeah. The Bik- Bikram yoga, it's yeah. called. Yeah. I, actually, I never tried it myself. Um I know it's kind of a growing craze. Maybe uh, Madonna brought, made it really popular. Uh-huh. Um, as far as I know, you do it in a sauna, but it can't possibly be a sauna. At like, <laughs> Not a real a sauna, sauna, right? Yeah, I don't know what the temperature is, but I, I think the philosophy behind it is to try to recreate the same climate as you'd find in India, where yoga originates. Oh, from. right, right. So you want it to be really hot. Hot or... humid, yeah. Oh, wow. And also people who like to get the kind of the the stretch value, but also like to sweat at yeah. the same time. If you want to sweat at yoga, then yeah, to crank up the temperature is going to help you. Wow, that's, that's intense. Like, well, what about, have you heard about CrossFit? CrossFit? Yeah, no. CrossFit's the big rage in America. CrossFit, no, no, I haven't heard of that. CrossFit is like people do all of these really old school exercises like push-ups or pull-ups. Style jumps. Um, they do like jumping jacks. They do really weird things like deadlifts, stuff like that. Um, but they do it one after the other in really short time intervals. Uh-huh. And yeah, like you're supposed to, like the workout only takes 12 minutes. Whoa. But if you do it right, I think you, yeah, like some people actually get so fatigued they throw up. So, like, you really push your body to the limit. <laughs> well, that is extreme. <laughs> it yeah. is extreme. Although I'm probably <laughs> saying it loss. wrong. Yeah. <laughs> so, but it's actually this is a big craze where people do more natural body movements, and you never do the same thing twice. You're not supposed to get into a routine. You always do things different. Do you do it like spontaneously, or you set yourself a program. Before I think that well, there's a whole website. You can go to the CrossFit website and they CrossFit. explain it all. Yeah, but it looks pretty cool. It's like not your typical gym type workout. Mm-hmm. CrossFit sounds like something you'd do on a BMX or something. <laughs> right, right. Exactly. Character change. What about your personality or your characteristics? Um, I would like to be more studious uh, for school because I am <laughs> I'm not that much of a... Um, yeah, stay home all night to study person. I look at my textbook and I really try, but then I realize I could be doing something else. So I just go out and do something else and I don't do my homework and I I don't fail because I am at least smart enough to pass. <laughs> but sometimes it's it's a struggle to get through. Um, so yeah, I would like to be more studious and more maybe hesitant in my answers because I talk before I think at some point uh, and sometimes. Um, I do like my, my open personality though. Like being like, for example, when we went out partying yesterday, I was talking to everybody, which was very nice. And people seem to like that open attitude as long as you're not being open and arrogant Mm because I try not to. Yeah. Uh, If you're being open and and open because you're interested in the person you're talking to, 
then you get more positive resp responses. Yeah. So I do like that. But being so open has caused you problems as well. I remember that guy thought that you liked him because you were so yeah, so nice to him. <laughs> I can't I can't help it. There was a a guy in my school, a, I don't know, a guy. He's probably in his forties, who went over and asked, and talked to me, and I I it's just impossible for me to say go away. So I ended up giving him my phone number, and now he calls me every night half past twelve on my phone, which is very loud and very annoying. Every night. And he, when I pick up, is well, he he stopped now because I don't pick up anymore. But in the beginning, he just, I pick up the phone and he said hi, and then I said, "What do you want?" And then he said, "Nothing much. How are you?" <laughs> like really, he didn't even want anything. He just wanted to talk to me, and yeah, that kind of problems happens <laughs> more than often because mm. I can't help it. What would you like to change about your status, like a uh, new house, a uh, job, a uh, boyfriend, anything like that? I would not mind finding a nice guy. I would not at all. I don't know about the specifics, and I'm not even sure I can handle a relationship right now. Maybe I just want to meet somebody to try and work it out with. Work it out with. But that's probably mo the most important thing, because I love where I live. I love my my study i don't have a job and that's really nice <laughs> i do have i saved up money before traveling so i do have a lot of money right now so i don't need to work and that's nice at the moment at the moment changes in appearance so maria uh, i thought we'd just talk about things like uh, what would you like to change about yourself so what would you like to change about your appearance? Well, I don't like the f like I don't like to think about changing myself. I like how people look from the birth, if you can say that. Um but if I should choose, I would like to change my height because I'm very tall and it does like cause a problem when I'm looking for a guy. It's especially since in the past I happened to fall for shorter guys and I got issues because they were always being intimidated by my height, even especially when I wore heel heels. Um, so I would like to be like have my body because I do like my long legs, but just be shorter and not be <sighs> taller than everybody yeah. <laughs> as I am at the moment. And all I, of my friends. <laughs> I guess that would also lead to you having problems finding shoes and clothes and oh, stuff indeed. like that. Indeed, yes, I have. To watch out. Well, in in my country, it's uh, it's not a problem to find shoe sizes because we are very tall people normally. Um, so shoes are big and clothes are big. But when I travel, I went to ch to China to um, to try to like visit a friend, and I wanted to go shopping, and it's impossible to find shoes and long long pants and fitting bras, too, <laughs> if you can imagine. So. That I would I would like to change my height, but otherwise I I can I might change like my weight, for example, or I have changed my hair color several times. I went from black to no, blonde to black to red to blonde. So <laughs> otherwise, I think I'm fine with me. Makeup. Uh, are you happy about it? Oh, now, like um, looking back, are you glad she did? It was her? it was tough love. Um, at the time, I hated her, and I was getting picked on a lot at school about it because mm. I just didn't realize that you know, as a female, you, you have to do these certain things. It's like this is what's acceptable in the community. You have to do this. So it's like I didn't realize it because I always played with the boys, mm. and none of them did this crap. <laughs> it's like, why do we have to worry about that? It sounds so, really kind of old-fashioned, doesn't it? Yeah, um, but I was actually, you know, now thinking about it, I'm happy that she did because, you know, it, it it brought it home to me that, that to a certain degree you do have to at least, you know, live with what your community, you know, accepts as standards. Like if you walk outside, you know, the community accepts that you have to, you know, wear a shirt when you go outside 
you can't go out topless, you, mm. you probably should wear the shirt <laughs> or you'll get looked at funny. So if I don't want my daughter to wear makeup, I should actually buy her some makeup and force her to wear it. <laughs> so, so she'll do the exact opposite. Well, I, I have heard that、uh, children do tend to do exactly what their parents tell them not to do.、Um, I, I just, I don't know.、Um, I didn't want to wear makeup, so my mom was concerned.、Um, I know a lot of people, though, who have had the opposite problem. Like when they're younger, like they're maybe seven or, or eight, and they want to wear makeup because mommy does.、Mm. And, you know, I, I had a lot of friends who would play dress up. They would sneak into mom's closet, steal all their, you know, her dresses and her high heels, and steal all her makeup and, you know, play dress up. And、mm. it, at a certain age, it was cute. But、um, my cousin actually、uh, was one of them, and she would wear makeup. She was to school,、um, and she was only an elementary schooler. Wow. So, that's、uh, pretty young. Yeah, there was a lot of,、uh, a lot of、uh, anger about that from the teachers, and、uh, it was not at all acceptable. <laughs> so I don't really know when the correct age is to wear makeup, but.、Um, I think、uh, at least if they're uh, uh, more mature or more adult like,、uh, I guess maybe it's all right. Once they become, they're no longer little girls anymore, then maybe they can let them wear makeup if they want.、Mm. But, oh,、yeah. cheers. Think, thanks for the advice, and <laughs> I'll use it wisely. <laughs> You're welcome. Tom Boy. Okay, so Rebecca,、um, mm -hmm. we just talked about kids and、um, uh, kids and technology. I,、uh, and, and you asked me about、um, whether or not I should give a cell phone to my son. Yeah.、Um, now I would like you to give me a little bit of advice、mm -hmm. for my daughter.、Um, <laughs> I have a daughter, and she's only seven months old, but I, <laughs> I、um, I'm worried about when she's older,、uh, when she gets a boyfriend, and, and when she has her first date. And, <laughs> When she will start wearing makeup. So,、um, could you, could you kind of give me some advice about this? Oh, well, I think maybe I had a bit of an unusual experience.、Um, my mom actually made me wear makeup、really? when I、uh, got into high school. It was like, you know, I, in middle school, I was the kid with, you know, braces and glasses you know, stuck in a book. And my mom was like, you can't do that in high school, you'll never meet anyone. Wow. So she took away my glasses and made me get contacts. And、uh, I couldn't do anything about the braces, but you know, as long as you cover your mouth or do、uh, something weird when you smile.、Yeah. Wow, that sounds quite the opposite to,、uh, <laughs> to many of my friends. Like, they, they all wanted to wear makeup, and、no. uh, their parents wouldn't let them. No, I was a tomboy. My mom was actually kind of worried. Like, she was like, do you, do you have any interest at all in girly things? I was like, no.、Nah. I don't like shoes. I don't like clothes. I don't need a purse. <laughs> I'll just go climb a tree. <laughs> so, so, do you think it's important as a parent to steer your children,、uh, like、mm. to, to kind of sculpt them and、um, make them into more rounded people? Or do you think you should just let them go?、Um, at the time, I think I actually resented my mom for it. Because, like, she, would, she waxed my eyebrows. Really?、Wow. My mom、uh, removed my eyebrows. She, she, peeled, she sat me down and was like, You have a unibrow. That is not acceptable. And she pinned me down and ripped them out. And I screamed and I hated her for weeks. Oh, wow. How old were you、um, when, when she did that? Oh, God. It was the end of middle school sometime. But <laughs> middle school, high school, somewhere in that area. So, like 15? 15 ish, yeah. <laughs> so, and I didn't shave either. My mom, my mom actually shaved my legs the first time. She's like, You need to shave this now. <laughs> I was like, Ginger snacks. Actually, I remember that one time you had a party and you made that really nice pumpkin dip. Oh, yeah, that's a popular one. Everyone loves that when I make it. What do you need for it? It's really easy. All you need is one can of canned pumpkin,、um, one eight ounce block of cream cheese, powdered sugar, and a few spices. Is it easy to make? It is. 
you just let the cream cheese melt a little and then you blend it together with the pumpkin and the powdered sugar. And then after you get that really smooth and creamy, then you put in the nutmeg, ginger, and cinnamon. Wow, that sounds yummy. It is. It's great. And then I usually put a few cinnamon sticks in for appearance and then serve it with ginger snaps and with um, green apples cut into slices. It's good with both of those. Cool. I'm going to try that sometime. What else can you make? Well, like I said, I'm not much of a cook, so I don't cook much. I put things together. I can, you know what? I have a blender and I do a lot of smoothies. I love making smoothies. Yeah, I buy the fruit and then keep the fruit in the freezer. That's the trick. You've got to freeze the fruit. And then you don't need ice so it doesn't taste watered down. So you take the frozen fruit, put it in the blender, and then you just mix it with yogurt or um, fruit juice and it's delicious. What kind of fruit do you like to use? Well, my favorite is just really simple. It's just frozen strawberries, frozen banana, orange juice, and a little honey if you want, but you don't even need the honey. And then I have another I like with mango and papaya and pineapple and yogurt. Well, between your smoothie and pumpkin dip and my eggplant curry, we can have throw quite a party. Let's do it. We'll do it on your rooftop with your cats. Sounds like a good idea. <laughs> Eggplant curry. So, Nabil, I really like that eggplant curry you made the other night. What's in that? Oh, he did? Okay. Um, it's actually really easy. There's, um, there's eggplant, and you need some potatoes, some tomatoes, and onions, and a few spices. Okay, what spices? Well, um, I use about half a teaspoon of turmeric powder and a teaspoon of coriander powder, red chili, and cumin. Are those easy to find at any grocery store? You can find them at most grocery stores nowadays. Um, if you can't find them at the major ones, then you might want to look for an international food store. And all of those carry the Indian spices. Okay. I have a really small kitchen. What kind of equipment do you need to make it? Oh, nothing at all. You just need a stove and you need a saucepan. Okay, yeah. I can handle yeah. that. So how do I make it? Well, first of all, you heat some oil in the saucepan. And when the oil is hot enough, then you add the chopped onions and a tablespoon of garlic paste and a tablespoon of ginger paste. Okay. And you let those cook for a few minutes until the onions are turned brown. Then after that, you add the tomatoes and let those cook for a bit until the tomatoes have gone soft. And then you add all the spices, the turmeric, the red chili, the coriander, the cumin, and the salt, of course. And just mix it up well at that point and add some water. Okay. The water prevents the spices from burning. After that, add the potatoes and then add the eggplants. And then pour in about a, a glass of water just to make sure that the, the potatoes and the eggplant are covered. And then you turn it to low heat and... Put the lid on and let it cook for about 15 minutes. Okay, I'm not much of a cook, but I think I can do that. I'll give it a try. Well, good luck. Thanks. <laughs> Maybe I'll have you over and let you try it. Yeah, I'd love that. All right. Nabi's Place So what about you? You're still in the same place, right? Yeah, I'm still there. Good. How's it going? Oh, it's, it's great. Um, I'm actually quite satisfied with it now. Oh, good, because I thought you wanted to move at one point. 
Yeah, I thought about it for a while, but then I decided to stay there. There's a lot of there's a lot of good points there. Um, it's a quiet neighborhood. It's not too far from the train, so I can get to work easily. For a while, I thought it might be a little too expensive, just slightly above my budget, but um, I've gotten used to it, and my cats love it. They're really comfortable there, so I think I'm going to stay. Oh, great. I love your cats. Do they have a lot of room to roam around? They have enough room. Of course, they, they were better off in the house. Right. I was living there last year, but they've adapted pretty well. So there's a roof there. I can take them up, and they run around. There's plenty of places for them to hide. Now, what about your neighbors? Are you still living near um, Matt, Matt and Laura? And Laura. Yeah. Right, right. Actually, it's really funny. Um, they've, they've been there for about four months, and last weekend they invited some people over, about five or six of their colleagues, and they had a little party. I think they played poker and... I had lots of booze around. But unfortunately, the, land, the neighbors complained to the landlord, and the landlords were just really angry. Oh, no. So they sent them this really harsh email and said that they wanted them out by the end of the week. <gasps> so, yeah, Matt and Laura have been kicked out of the building. You are kidding. No. <laughs> wow, and just five people over. Yeah, it was like five or six people, and but apparently it was loud enough. I think it's because the neighborhood is kind of family-oriented, so um, people aren't used to loud parties. Oh, so. right. Maybe the voices carry a lot. In the- yeah, there's a lot of echo in the building, actually, for some mm-hmm. reason. So. Well, that's too bad for them. Where did they move? They just moved down the street to another apartment building. It's smaller, so I don't think they're happy about it, but oh well. Well, tell them I said hey when you see them. I will, yeah. Ginger's Place. So, Ginger, I hear you have a new apartment. Yes, it's great. I just moved in last week. Nice. Where is it? It's near Victory Monument. Do you know where that is? Yeah, I do. Um, How do you get to work from there? Well, I take the Sky Train. Oh, that's really convenient. It is, it is. I, it's just a five-minute walk. Okay. And what's the neighborhood like? It's a crowded neighborhood. There are a lot of people, lots of cars, just lots of energy in general. And is it conveniently located? It's very convenient. It's about a five-minute walk to the Sky Train station. Okay. Why did you decide to move? Well, it's near a park, and I love living near a park. And it's also just a five-minute walk to my gym. And have you made any new friends in that neighborhood? I have. I've met a couple of people in my apartment building, and I've gotten to know the person who owns a restaurant across the street. There's some great restaurants on the street also. What kind of restaurants? Well, mostly Thai restaurants. A lot of Thai people live in the area. Um, but there's also a Western uh, restaurant and a Japanese. Okay. And is it a safe neighborhood? I feel very safe there. Mm-hmm. Um, I've heard that there's some thefts on some of the quiet streets where the motorbikes will ride by and snatch your bag off your shoulder. But I've never actually seen it myself, and I feel very safe sleeping there. What about traffic? There is a lot of traffic. Oh, no. Yes, the traffic. um, And a lot of street traffic, too. Lots of people walking on the street. So it can be tough to get around. But there's still a lot of excitement in the area, so it's fun to be out and people watch. It doesn't sound like a quiet neighborhood. No, it's not quiet at all, unless you go into the park, and then it's very quiet. How often do you go to the park? Almost every night. Every night after work, I'll take a walk in the park, and there's a pond with a water display with music. So it can be very soothing. Sports Divided. 
Shirley, one question, please. I'm a bit confused now. One thing, when, when about sports, sometimes I can see UK play something with the team. Sometimes you're all divided. Why is that? So we are essentially still four countries, four separate countries in a United Kingdom. So, um, yeah, basically each country just wanted to keep their national team. In the case of the Olympics, for some reason, and I'm not sure of the exact reason, but the Olympics committee uh, didn't want um, four divided teams from Great Britain. They wanted a representative of the United Kingdom. So they, they basically made the rule that Great Britain had to send a team and not uh, teams from the four individual countries. Um, so, yeah, so we are a United Kingdom, but we're still very much four independent countries. Uh, and each country is very proud of their, their own national teams for football and for rugby and things like that. And, um, yeah, but uh, it's good that we get together for, for the Olympics and, and we can perform as uh, one united country. Okay, thank you very much. Countries United. So, Shirley, we were talking about politics. How is the situation in your country? Well, you know, I'm pretty much an on-the-fence kind of person and politics is, is not my forte. It's not something I like to get into a conversation about. So uh, I'll just change the subject if that's all right. I will, I'd like okay. to tell you a bit about um, uh, the United Kingdom. You know, I'm from Scotland and, you know, where is Scotland? I get this question so often. Is that in Norway? And um, is it a, a region of England? So just to, to clarify, um, it's pretty complicated. But uh, in the United Kingdom, the UK, we have uh, Scotland, England, Wales and Northern Ireland. And then people know Great Britain. Yes, okay. so I do. Great Britain is Scotland, England and Wales. To, to give the, the country its full title, it's the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. That's the full title for, for the UK or Great Britain or GB or um, England is just one country within four that are united. It sounds right. really Complicated. But it is the biggest one, right? England is the biggest country with a population of 40 million. Scotland's about 5 million. Um, now, I correct myself. England is, I think, 49 million. Wales is about 2 million. Northern Ireland, about 2 or 3 million. So in total, the whole of the United Kingdom is about 60 million population. How did that come about? Uh, go back 300 years or more even. Uh, England and Wales united over 300 years ago. And then Scotland was invited to, to join the union between England and Wales. Uh, Scotland agreed with actually many conditions. Uh, for example, one of the conditions was the, the money the the value of of the pound uh in scotland we have bank of scotland pounds and in england it's bank of england pounds it's all the same sterling currency of the uk just uh in it's very difficult in england to spend any money that's got bank of scotland written on it even though it's all the same money anyway that's another issue so um yeah, 300 years ago, Scotland joined the, the union between England and Wales to become Great Britain. And then I think early in the 1800s, that's when uh, Ireland joined. Um, of course, now it's just Northern Ireland and um, there's other history related to that. We could go on all day talking about uh, how, it, how it became Northern Ireland. Um so, yeah, so when people think of the UK, they generally think the UK is England, but uh, it's, it's actually four countries. So, mm. Island invasion. Yeah, 
in Australia, there's lots of snakes as well. Is there snakes in Guam? Oh, yeah. There's plenty of snakes in Guam. Um, one of which is very famous is the brown tree snake. Now, the brown tree snake was brought over to Guam a long time ago in cargo ships uh, when it hid in the cargo, and the cargo was unloaded onto uh, the docks of Guam. So when these brown tree snakes uh, were accidentally released onto Guam soil, they subsequently destroyed most of Guam's bird population. Can you believe that? Oh, that's amazing. So, yeah, introductions like that can cause disasters yeah, for wildlife. Yeah, mm. exactly. And because these brown tree snakes destroyed most of the bird life on Guam, um, we've lost a lot of beautiful tropical birds that used to live on Guam. Um, another thing that I can think of that was introduced to Guam but isn't a wild animal is a wild plant. And we call it a Japanese bonsai leaf, actually. Um, and I believe bonsai means uh, suicide or something in Japanese. But what these leaves do is that they grow and grow and they look like vines. So they cover loads and loads of trees and good wildlife that are out there. Um, I mean, plant life. Um, and they keep these plant life from growing because they essentially ambush them and keep sunlight from ever reaching them. Oh, that's really interesting. Yeah. So if you can imagine a building covered completely in really thick vine, that's how these, uh, these uh, Japanese bonsai leaves work. They completely shroud and cover all of the good um, plant life that we have on Guam. So we've lost a lot of good plant life, beautiful um, different types of uh, leaves and bushes and flowers. flowers. Mm. Yeah. So in addition to losing all of our bird life, we've also lost <laughs> a lot of this uh, uh, plant life to this introduction of a foreign plant species to Guam. Island dangers. Is there any natural disasters which happen? Yeah, there's plenty of natural disasters. Um, Guam is actually um, right on the coast of um, a reef formation called the Marianas Trench. Um, and underneath, uh, in this trench, is the lowest part of the world, uh, the deepest part of the world. <laughs> yeah, so if uh, we joke about it, we joke that Guam's highest mountain, Mount uh, Lam Lam, is actually uh, the highest mountain in the world if you count off from its base, which is in the Marianas Trench, the lowest part of the world. Oh, that's amazing. So there must be good diving if you talk about barrier reefs. And yeah, there's mm. plenty of good diving. Um, it's got really great diving like in, you would find in Hawaii or in the Great Barrier Reef. Mm. Um, and many, many tourists from all over Asia come to Guam to scuba dive yeah. because uh, there are great spots. And it's the closest uh, U.S. soil they can get to. Ah, I see. But in Australia, in the Great Barrier Reefs, there's lots of dangerous animals. Is that the case in Guam as well? Or? Well, actually, um, that's funny you should ask. Uh, there has been a recent article about a guy in Guam, um, a very young guy who was scuba diving, and he got stung by a lionfish. Huh. But that is the extent of the the dangerous animals of Guam, you'd have to go out into the deep sea to find more dangerous animals. But I think the most dangerous ones we have are quite small. Uh, things like the lionfish, which I just mentioned, he just got stung, but uh, it wasn't anything terrible. Um, we do have uh, reef sharks, mm. but they are not great white sharks, so they're quite small. 
Um, and smaller poisonous things like trigger fish, um, those you just have to be careful about when, whenever you're scuba diving. But other than that, there's not much uh, dangerous in the sea. Great. The Big Mix. So, Clayton, you're from uh, Trinidad and Tobago, and you were saying that your country has a very diverse multicultural mix? Yes. Can you talk about that? Oh, sure. Um, Trinidad and Tobago, mostly, we're made up of people from Africa, African descent, who came as slaves, and Indians, who came from um, India, mostly, I think. I think we also may have some from parts of Bangladesh, Pakistan, and Sri Lanka. Um, but they came as indentured laborers um, closer to when slavery was being abolished. And these two groups actually make up the two largest ethnic groups in Trinidad. However, there's a lot of mixing. There, it's very difficult to find someone in Trinidad and Tobago who is extremely purely of one ethnic group because mm. everyone is kind is sort of mixed we have also a lot of whites or caucasians who are native to trinidad and tobago who speak exactly like me with my caribbean accent uh -huh. and many people find it very strange because they will walk around in trinidad and think that they're tourists and but realize that they're actually <laughs> native trinidadians um and many also come from europe to settle in Trinidad after retirement and have their families here. So um, this is how they came to stay here. We have a very large Chinese population, and it's growing because now the government is encouraging um, immigrants from China to come in to help us with our development to build our capital city. So we have a lot of Chinese. We have a lot of Colombians, Venezuelans, uh, people coming from South and Central America. Uh, migrating to Trinidad because Spanish is now being um, promoted as a second language for Trinidad. So street signs in our capital city are in English and Spanish. So with all of this mixing of different of different people, it's it's very, as I said, very difficult to find one person who is of just one ethnic group, and it's reflected in our food. It's reflected in the kind of music we listen to, sometimes in the way we dress. Um, for me, for example, um, I am mostly of African descent, but my dad is mixed with uh, people from South American uh, ethnicity and Chinese. So, as I said, although I am mostly African, everybody still has a little bit of something in them. Winning. Okay, Monica, we're going to debate winning in sports, especially for young people. Mm. So do you think that winning should be stressed with sports, with, let's say, high school athletes? Um, well, it depends on the situation and what they're training for. But um, generally, I think that winning is um, overemphasized in sport. I think that participation is more important. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Why why would you say that? Well, I think um if you concentrate too much on winning, then the problem is if you don't win, you don't enjoy the sport. So, um the emphasis is is shifted from enjoyment to uh basically results. So, I think it can be quite um damaging. Right. Oh, I, I kind of agree with what you're saying. Um, and actually, I played high school sports, and I was never very good. And I always wish I participated more than I did. But I, I actually think that the the focus on winning, in some ways, is quite important, and that that it does serve a a good purpose to have a focus on winning rather than on participation. I think the main reason is because when you focus on winning, that drives everybody to be better. So if you want to if you want to win if you want to be on the team etc you have to force yourself to be better and um it's the carrot on the end of the stick and it it makes people train harder work harder it sets a goal for them and it kind of prepares them for life that sometimes you fail and sometimes you don't get what you want 
And so that's why sports and the whole focus on winning is good because it's exactly how life is in the real world. Mm, I would tend to argue the other way and say that actually sport doesn't reflect life um, in terms of winning and losing. I mean, let's take a work situation. It's not about um, winning or losing. It's about cooperating with people that you work with. And so if you have had an upbringing where you've been in a sports team that has been overly competitive, you could transfer that competitiveness into a workplace and it can be counterproductive because it may mean that you, um, you're just not very good at being a team player um, in a work environment. That's actually a really good point. But you could also argue that actually, you know, even a work environment is like sport and that you have teamwork and you have to work together. And if you don't work together uh, in a very productive way, maybe you'll be out of a job or your company won't be productive. So you need to have that, that instinct to continually drive to be better, to be better than other people. And it sounds really brutal, but I think that's just how business works. Well, you're talking about work being business, but I mean, I'm a teacher and um, I, it brings me to a quite an interesting discussion that's taking place now in teaching, which is two different um, kind of political views, really, in terms of teachers, because um, people want high, standard, high standards in terms of their teachers. And um, one idea is to... Um, rate teachers in comparison to other teachers and basically give the top teachers um, incentives um, so that they get paid more than teachers who aren't as good as them. But um, the counter-argument to that is that it creates a really hostile environment in the workplace and in a school where you really need teachers to work together um, I'm not sure that that's the best way to go. Mm. Yeah, well, that's a, that's another debate for another day. But, <laughs> <laughs> Is that a cop out or what? <laughs> Physical education. So, Monica, you actually are a trained physical education teacher. Ah, yes, that's right. So we often hear about how kids today are not fit and they don't exercise enough. Do you think that's true? Um, I think it is true, yes. I think kids these days spend a lot more time on the computer than they used to. So, um, of course, that means less time outside and getting fit. Mm. Now, in, in some countries, there's a big debate about how much fitness kids actually do in school. So in your country, in New Zealand, uh, do kids still do a lot of fitness actually in school? Um, well, reasonably recently, the PE curriculum got amalgamated with the health curriculum, so PE and health were considered uh, to be important in school, and um, the health side of the curriculum is often taught in the classroom, and of course the PE side is um, often taught outside the classroom. Um and there is always debate about how much um, kids should be doing inside school. In fact, very recently, um, now that it has become quite a big problem in New Zealand for teenagers, um, there has been talk about increasing the number of PE lessons that students have. But um, the current Prime Minister, I think, believes that the emphasis should be put on out-of-school activities like clubs and encouraging students to become more involved in that side of things. What, what do you feel? Do you think that it should be... Um, I actually agree, to be honest, because I think if you increase the number of uh, PE lessons that students have in a week, it doesn't actually um, necessarily increase their motivation to be involved in physical activity. But if, um, like he's suggesting, you increase the opportunities outside of school, um, students maybe become <laughs> involved in a sport that they choose, that they like to do, 
and they um, hopefully can take it on as a lifetime sport, yeah, which is important. But wouldn't the counter-argument be that only kids that actually have a natural inclination to play sports will want to join those clubs, and that the kids that are more sedentary or don't enjoy physical activity won't join a, a club? And so you need to actually make them do fitness in school? Yeah, that's true. That is a counter argument mm, and a very good one so I guess to argue <laughs> 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 on right. some other occasion. Of course, I can talk about that side of the um, argument as well if you want me to. Mm. No, it's okay. It's okay. So but basically you say there's a, it's both sides make a good point. 